I have no words. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Desiree Dawson. ABC is in the house. Um, that is the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. They actually put this on with us. Um, please a round of applause for them. Thank you. Um, we have Shannon, Seth, Marijuan, Emma, Aglika, and Chuka from the CCPABC. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Now, just a couple reminders here. Um, like the event stated, I'm guessing you all read the event description, or if you're like me, you just saw the posters, saw Desmond Cole, saw Desiree Dawson, like, I'm there. Um, but this space is centering black voices, okay? Now, what that means is if you're not a person of color, not a black person in this space, um, if you're a white person in this space, um, please be mindful of that. Uh, whenever we do questions and answer, or people need to have something to say, we will hear their um, back our voices first, um, for the sake of time as well. We will keep some time at the end for mingling in other conversations, but like the event said, it is centering black voices. Okay, thank you. Now, if you're uh, triggered by any of the conversation that we're having, if something comes up for you that's really heavy, you need to talk to someone, um, please come to myself. My name is Sandra, and we have Morgan as well, right there. And uh, we will be able to listen. Like, we are trained um, active listeners, and we're here to kind of hold space for you as well, okay? Thank you. Um, are y'all ready for this one call or what? Yeah. Good try. That did not sound like you're ready. Are you ready? That's much better. The first one kind of bit dehydrated. I was like, there's juice yeah. over there. The water, please take care of your needs. Um, now, Desmond Cole, Desmond Cole. Well, I've been calling him Desmond. I accidentally called him Des. My friend was like, no, 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 I'm bored. I'm bored. You don't know him like that. Um, and just because I've spent the last couple days uh, with him since I arrival to Vancouver, we all know what happened uh, to him in the first 24 hours of being here. Um, shame, right? Yeah. Awful. Awful. Um, and I remember, like, seeing him a few days after that, and uh, he had all this media, all this, you know, asking how he's doing and all that stuff, and we all turned and look at him, and Morgan and I were like, have you had water, coffee today? And he's like, no. And he had all these things to do, and he just, he was taking care of business, making sure that this was, that the public news was not acceptable, that the police knew was not acceptable, and actually forgot to hydrate. So we had to force feed him a bunch of stuff, and he was good to go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, for those of you that don't know who Desmond Cole is, Desmond Cole is an award-winning writer whose work focuses primarily on systemic racial injustice in Canada. His first book, The Skin We're In, slated to be published in September of 2019, is less than a year away. Yeah. So if y'all gonna clap, please clap like you mean it. And I always say, like, say it your chest, but clap with your chest. You know what I mean? Like, just clap like you mean it, please. Um, his first book exposes policing practices that disproportionately target people of color in Canada and explores the experiences of black Canadians. Now, without further ado, please welcome Desmond Cole.
this is too much. <laughs> In like the best way. Let me start just, I'm gonna say thank you. Uh, Sandra, thank you. Thank you for being on that first call where we brainstormed what this could be. And you know, thank you for welcoming me this is just being in the room, just having this room tonight. Before anything, just seeing the room fill up tonight was enough for me. Um, this is too much, like this is too good. And I wanna thank you, and I wanna thank Black Lives Matter Vancouver for being here and for making this evening possible. Thank you for the work you did. It's been a great privilege to get to um, know a lot of the members of BLM Vancouver, to hang out with you, to work alongside of you this week. And may that friendship and that kinship continue. Um, thank you to our friends at the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives for being the support in making sure that this event could be possible for making sure that we have this space this evening, for supporting me last night at the incredible gala that you had. Thank you to the CCPA. Uh, thank you to every single person who's come here this evening. Um, thank you to all of the young ones that are here in the room tonight for being here too. Desiree Dawson. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Thank you so, so much for sharing your spirit and for opening this space for everybody. Um, something that I heard and just felt from you that um, is really working inside of me right now, <sighs> given what's going on this week for me, is that um, there's this weird irony about our communities, our black communities, plural, because we are so many communities. There's like this thing, because we're only those communities because of what has happened to us. And um, this space is special right now for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons it's special for me right now is because of what happened to me and the way in which every person that has come and has said, Desmond, I heard about what happened. I'm sorry, what happened to you? People who don't know me, you know? Um, that is possible because something really horrible happened. And um, yet we are here. And yet you can hold me as community and encourage me and help me heal from that really awful shit that went down. Excuse my language for the younger ones. Right? Or the older ones who don't like those languages. <laughs> um, so we have to go through it for this to mean what it means. And I heard that in your words and in your song. And thank you for sharing that and for giving that inspiration and for saying also that, you know, we can envision a future where things are gonna be okay. I appreciate that very, very much and I appreciate your artistry. Thank you. say lots of things I like I like talking and stuff but um, help me now I want to hear from some of you in the room and um, 
help you, get you to help me and help the room to open this space up even more now. Um, oh, I'm so overwhelmed with emotion. You guys are just gonna have to. Take your time. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know what, actually, let's sit down. I, yeah. I, I, do you guys mind? No. <laughs> Everybody can still see. I can still see most all of you, so this feels better. <laughs> um, it don't move, I don't think. Does it? Oh, okay. Watch it, watch it, watch it, watch it. Watch it. Thank you. Um, maybe we can just start with this idea and this theme of the challenges that bring us together as a community and as communities, all of us in this space tonight. And in reflecting on some of the questions that uh, were at your tables, for those of you who are here for the round table section, um, maybe some of the questions that are on these paper are what why, are you why, here this why, are, maybe some why are you here? And what is it about our communities that draws you to these spaces and to this conversation? What have you been hoping to want to talk about in a space like this, which I should imagine doesn't happen here all the time. It doesn't happen a lot of places in this country all the time. This is a beautiful space and a beautiful gathering. Um, what did you guys talk about? What did you guys share? What did you hear that really made you pause or think or connect with something else that you were feeling? I know it's not easy to be the first one or two, but you don't have to give a speech. You, you don't have to, you know, whatever you feel comfortable saying or sharing, I would like to hear some of that from you so that I can respond back and then open up that room so you know the harmonies are gonna break out. <laughs> and I'm like looking forward to that, right? Because I'm like, these are the things for me that feel so right, that feel safe. I know I can do that in a room like this because I know what's I I know what to expect, and it just feels right and good, and it feels like home. And you know, Desiree, you said home is where our hearts are, and um, music has always been for me a really, really big part of finding that feeling of home and comfort. And so when I'm sad, uh, I'm usually singing alone. And to not have to do that tonight, to just move and sing and dance with all of you. These are the gifts. These are the forms of healing that we can actually provide for each other as community, as black people, as people of color, as community in general. That is a gift that we can never allow people to rob us of. You know, it's not all about um, what I might describe as the big W work that people think is the work, capital T, capital W. Singing to each other, holding each other, dancing with each other is also capital T, capital W. Laughing is the word. washing over me. Um, this is my, I guess only maybe like my second trip as an adult to Vancouver. 
The first time I was here, it rained for like 60 hours in a row. <laughs> I didn't go around to see much of the city. I didn't know many people. Um, so it was kind of grim. And then I came back, and I intentionally came back early this week, knowing that yesterday and tonight, before leaving again tomorrow, that I would have these events, and I wanted to do some different things in the city. So I decided to come early and um, try to enjoy. And, um, you know, that worked out in a certain way that all of you know about by now, I think, um, where I was stopped by the police just trying to walk to the park. So let me tell you about some, and this, these are the kind of things that, like, I wouldn't have spoken about last night at the CCPA gala. It's more formal. Um, no shade at all, by the way. CCPA. <laughs> like, legit, none. But, like, uh, it's just a different space, yeah. a different audience, and different container. Um, but I can tell you guys that my intention in going to Stanley Park yesterday or Tuesday when I was stopped by the police was actually to just be in awe of nature a little bit. And this is one of the greatest gifts that I've been able to give myself in the last couple of years. I grew up in the east kind of edge of the suburban GTA in a city called Oshawa, Ontario. Although I was born in Red Deer, Alberta, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know, I know guys, I know. Okay, let me tell you what's wild though. Like, let me tell you what's wild, is that I've been in Toronto since, I've been living in Toronto since 2004, and in the time that I've been in Toronto, we have elected Rob Ford as mayor, we have, um, invited most recently a white supremacist to speak to thousands of people at a theater in Toronto. So if I say I'm born in Toronto, nobody's like, oh damn. Like this is our country. This is the whole damn thing, right? The whole thing. Um, Red Deer, if you're curious um, about like my parents, some of their experience there, because we left there when I was like five and a half. So there's specific memories that I have and then a lot of things that I don't remember. But outside of what you would expect and why you want to, ooh, right? Uh, there were a lot of white people actually who were uncommonly kind to our family when we arrived here. Um, I remember the first woman who took care of us in the day when my parents went to work was a white woman and I would watch Mr. Rogers' neighborhood in her house. And, um, I didn't understand anything about race when I was a kid. Um, so Oshawa is, you know, started going to elementary school. And uh, we lived in a new subdivision and very, very close to a ravine where you could go and go down to the creek. You could catch frogs. You could find the tree swing that somebody built the summer before abandoned and tested to see if it was safe to use. You just play outside all the time. And there is this wonder, this awe of nature. And growing up and, you know, getting into the work slowly, capital T, capital W, um, I've realized how easy it is to forget about things like this. So, in the last couple of years, um, something good has happened. Thanks. 
something really great has happened, which is that I, like, I don't know why, but I rediscovered this feeling that I used to have. I wanted to be outside, looking at nature, exploring again. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, What that has uh, meant for me. Thank you. <laughs> the brown ones cut up your nose, right? <laughs> Myself taking pictures of the neighborhood that I lived in in High Park in Toronto like a tourist and seeing all of these um, gardens and looking at flowers and looking at colors and really liking this and being like I want this um, and so you know when you're in a new place and people say hey go to Stanley Park I just imagine myself, I hear about some of the trees, the sides, and I, I can't imagine it in my mind. Khaled was telling me today that there are trees, there are trees that are five meters wide in the park, five meters. And I'm like, I don't, my mind can't imagine it. I have to see it. Um, I didn't make it because on the way there, I was stopped by a cop. And um, so now I need healing from that. Now I need like to step back from that. And all of the support and all of the um, warmth and care that I have received. And all of the jokes that we've made at the expense of these pricks that did this. <laughs> This is like what the black community really is about for me. In so many ways, the resiliency, the concern, the gentleness, it's all been on display mostly from people I never met in my life. But I came here and I found you and you found me and that means so much to me. And so much for that healing that I need to go through now. Um, There's been a question a lot of people have asked me that I feel like I can address here now too, which is, um, I heard the mayor wanted to talk to you. And did you talk to the mayor and what did the mayor say to you and how did that go? And um, the mayor of this city, as much as many of you, might want to say, Desmond, I'm sorry about what happened. Desmond, I am embarrassed about what happened to you. Um, but he doesn't owe it to me the way he owes it to every single person in this room, particularly the black and indigenous people in this room. That responsibility, I didn't elect him, you know, and I'm not served directly by him or the city council here. You are. And I'm going to leave tomorrow, but I will tell all of you that um, the mayor did call me and Colin was with me and we spoke for maybe 20 minutes. And when the media was calling being like, so what are you going to talk about? I said, well, he's calling me but also none of your damn business. <laughs> but also, who cares? Because I'm going home. And the problem that I found here, the problem that found me here, the racist culture that's so efficient that I couldn't be on the ground for 24 hours without being stopped. So much so that some white folks on the internet 
you've all heard of the internet. Um, <laughs> some folks were like, this must be a setup somehow. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. All you have to do is be black and start walking. And boom! <laughs> Total setup. I love when they act like we're the ones in control. Like, yes, it, this shit is rigged, guys, but we're not the ones doing it, you know what I mean? <laughs> Um, so, it's not really about what any person in power can offer me now. What are they going to offer the people in this room? What are they going to offer the people in this city who are regularly the targets? And, and, and I would encourage something from all of you, actually. If you find yourself speaking about that issue later on, or about attendant issues in the black community, in our black communities. Don't allow people to confine you to some subject matter area. Don't be a subject matter expert on policing or on blah, blah, blah. No, I don't have to talk to you about whether or not my personal experience on Tuesday was real or valid. Because I know that the police officer who stopped me is not any different from the teacher that gets scared of the black child and kicks them out of the classroom. I know that. I know it's not actually really different from the CAS worker that says that a black or an indigenous person doesn't know how to parent their child and takes the child away. Any system in this country and particularly, let's talk like government structures, institutional structures. Any one of them that has the ability to punish people, black and indigenous people in this country face a punishment unlike other groups. Clockwork. It's like so efficient at finding us and at getting us. And you know, it's funny. People on the internet were like making up bylaws about why I had to be stopped that don't even exist. I talk about white improv sometimes. White supremacist, no, for real. White supremacist improv. I am so desperate to see you as a black person held in line and learn your place that I'll just make up a rule that don't exist. I am the one, after all, as a white person who gets to decide these things, so who really cares what you think you did or didn't do? Really, it's our job to civilize you. It's our job to put you in your place. Oh, God. <laughs> am I lying? No. Yeah. no. Preach. Yeah, fact. Preach. So, these conversations can be narrowed to the point where they're meaningless. And in the same way, somebody trying to respond to this situation who's in power by being like, Desmond, I need to call you and get to the bottom of this. It narrows the conversation to the point where we're not really talking about what we're talking about anymore. Mm -hmm. And I can't allow that to happen and we cannot allow that to happen. So an analysis of what's happening for us that talks about how black people are being treated in every facet of life in this country is very valuable and it's real for us. And we should never lose our reality in any one of these interactions or conversations for the sake of trying to make a point or prove ourselves to anybody. We don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's just something that I've really had reinforced this week that I wanted to um, and I want to say I wanted to share with everybody. You have the right as black people, we have the right to demand what we need instead of hoping that people are gonna come along with us for the ride. For real. Um, and that doesn't mean that we're unrealistic either. It doesn't mean that we're impractical, that we are, we're lacking in strategy. That's not what it means. There is nothing more impractical 
than expecting that this white supremacist system is going to save black people or finally see or acknowledge us. That's the dream, that's the myth. That someday this system that was designed to do what it's doing to us is actually going to turn itself around and be like, you know what, I was wrong. <laughs> that's not going to happen, that's, that's the fantasy. Um, what's real, I think, for example, is to say about policing, because I wanted to give some specifics about policing at the gala last night that I didn't do, and maybe this is my chance. But yeah. like, for example, okay, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, when a police officer stops you for no reason, they are violating multiple so-called fundamental rights in the Charter. Now, I will start off by saying that if you are indigenous to this country, to these territories, because it wasn't really a country, and in my opinion, Canada is actually not a real thing. It's still not really a country. But if you are indigenous to these territories, or if you are black, that charter of rights and freedoms is not for you. Sorry. It's cool though, that, that's not on us. That's not on us. It was made in spite of our needs. It's not an accident. Um, but the Charter says, just for fun, let's, let's kick it around for a minute. Everyone has the right not to be arbitrarily detained by the police. That's in the, in the Charter. The Charter says, and by the way, what happened to me and what happens to us in these carding situations is totally arbitrary. Some people say random, but random would mean uh, black person. <laughs> Don't say random, okay? It ain't random. It's arbitrary. Or you could just say it's bogus. But the Charter says that that's not allowed. The Charter also says everyone has the right to be free from unreasonable search or seizure. The police officer who stopped me yesterday threatened to search me. Um, again, completely against the Charter. But, guys, if the Charter recognized Black and Indigenous people's rights, we would not be sitting in this room right now. Um, those are the things, some of the things that the law is supposed to be protecting us from, which it is failing to do because the white supremacist system that designed those laws doesn't care whether it protects us or not. And actually it is fine with not protecting us because then we can be the ones who live in the prison so that somebody else can make money staffing the prison and sweeping the prison and locking the jail doors in the prison and building the prison. That's what we do. That's what our role has become. And they need to have people who fall outside of the protection of law to keep that malicious system going, right? So, um, what I want to say about that, are you good? Thank you. What I want to say about that is just like, um, we have that regime, it's failing, and that's a problem, but we shouldn't lower our needs. We shouldn't reduce our expectations for what we want. So for me, practically speaking, if the charter says I have all those rights, you as a police officer shouldn't have any beef with doing the following. Hey sir, how are you doing today? Do you mind if I have a conversation with you? You're not in any trouble. You're not under arrest and you can leave at any time, but I just want to talk to you. And what white supremacy does is it tells white people that's not safe. But that's not safe because every one of us has this oozing potentiality to hurt them. So we can't be allowed to be told what our charter right is. Because then if we have ill intention, we might use it to subvert the law. You know, criminals have rights apparently too. So even if I'm a corrupt-ass person, 
That doesn't mean my rights disappear under the law. Any police officer who is actually trying to uphold what they say is peace and order and safety shouldn't have a problem telling a civilian what is already in law. It's not a guessing game, y'all. So that is one way, rights notification. When I say abolish, because I'm an abolitionist when it comes to the whole police system. That's me. But we need a roadmap to get there. And part of that roadmap says, level out that power imbalance by forcing the police to tell us, to articulate themselves, to keep them in check as they're doing their job. Make them say it to us. Because you know something? First of all, a cop who's so hateful of the 16-year-old black guy with the dreads that he can't tell him his rights, get off the force, get out. We don't want you. And whatever we would replace with whatever you call the police now, that regime wouldn't include people who can't do that. So that's part of the test now. If you can't do that, then this is not the right job for you. And if you fail to do that, we're gonna remove you. That's one thing, it's very practical. Another thing, a receipt. Now, I'll say this with a caveat because I don't think that the police should be keeping records on innocent people. I'll say that again, the police should not keep records on innocent people. We live in a police state. I wish we didn't, but that's one of the features of the police state that we live in, is that you are guilty until proven innocent in this system, no matter what you are told, particularly black people and indigenous people. So, there are times, okay, when I agree that someone, not the police that we have existing in the world today, but in the world that I imagine where we replace them with something better, there are times when I can justify why a police officer might want to document an interaction with a civilian. But I'll tell you something. Anybody in this room ever received a traffic ticket? A few of you? What do you get when you receive a ticket? You get a piece of paper that says, here's what we say you did, here's the consequence for what we say you did, and if you don't agree that we did, or you did what we say you, we, you did, here's actually what you can do about it. Here's who you can contact, here's how you can fight back, here's how you can complain. And in Toronto, we have these corrupt police officials who are like, yeah, you know, wish we could go back to the good old days when you didn't have to tell these idiots how to complain. This is literally what's being said now because they're so resentful that we're getting some traction on reining in their card and behavior. Nobody would expect you to show up to court without a receipt for what they said you did. If you absolutely have to take my information, I want a carbon copy of what you took from me. And I want your name at the bottom so that I can follow up with your badge number. I do. I have to have it. I need a receipt. Black people love receipts, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> and it's for a very good reason because the documentation of 400 plus years of subjugation on these territories, the ability not to lose the ancestral memory of what we've been through has been critical for us. And that continues today. So we need to have a receipt. And again, just like they say to us, I'm gonna flip it back on you now. If you're not doing anything wrong, what's the problem? Please give me a receipt. That's, some, that's the second. Now the third thing, and I think honestly, you do these three things and you do them faithfully and you do them right, the prevalence of carding that we see in the world today, it just, it gets diminished. It won't end or disappear completely, but 
this, these things would really, really change the practice. The third thing is, all of the information that has been collected, all of that, so, so, so first, I want to share a parallel with you now. I told the police officer who was racially profiling me, you are racially profiling me. I told him to his face. I said a lot of things. <laughs> I wanted to record the interaction, but hand to God, I thought if I put my hand in my pocket to get my phone, y'all know. Mm -hmm. So I didn't do that. And I want to say too, before I continue, that what I did on Tuesday is not a roadmap for any person who gets stopped by the police. I have a set of protections and experiences and um, personal circumstances around this kind of behavior that give me a form of protection that many do not have who are dark-skinned black people like me. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I don't want somebody, I don't want a young person to be like, well, I'm going to be like that. Because it might not work out for you the way it worked out for me. Mm -hmm. And that scares me. Right? So we have to keep ourselves safe first and foremost. We have to get out of these situations alive first and foremost because we know what the police do. And they don't need a pretext. But um, let me go back. Uh, I, I, I told him, I know what you're doing and it's wrong. He said, I'm not racially profiling you. Obviously, he said that. When I went to the police station after this was over, and they ultimately sent a sergeant to come and speak with me, he said, now, I wasn't there. I've heard your end of things, and I called the police officer, and I've heard his end of things. But, you know, I wasn't there, and it's impossible for me to adjudicate. He then immediately went on to say that what happened to me was not racial profiling, <laughs> that there is not racism in the Vancouver Police Department. <laughs> I'm just thinking of that Simpsons episode when the teacher says, the children are right to laugh at you, Ralph. Like, we should laugh at that, it's ridiculous. He told me that the Vancouver police, when I am saying that, you know, white people are calling the police on us just because we're us, he denied that that happens too. So his first act was to try and gaslight me. Okay? But I want to draw that parallel to what happened when the media in this city first tried to get information about carding. Do you know what they were told by the police? We don't collect that information. We don't collect race-based stop information in Vancouver. We don't have a race problem here. Why would we collect that information? But then some enterprising person did a freedom of information request <laughs> and up popped 10 years of information about who is stopped based on race. According to that data, and for those of you who do not know, although black people represent less than 1% of the population of Vancouver, we were 5% of those stopped. And although indigenous people represent about 2% of Vancouver's population, they were about 16% of those stopped and carted. And that doesn't capture interactions like my own, where somebody says, get lost. So it was very interesting to see in the media that the police saying it's not carding because no information was collected. That means you just failed at your attempt to card me, but you still tried. Mm -hmm. But you see the parallel. They try to tell you it's not happening, as a first step, they try to make you doubt yourself so bad that you go away and you stop asking the questions. It's a tactic. The police officer did it to me, the sergeant did it to me, and the police force did it to the city of Vancouver before they got exposed. So this brings me to that third thing, which is, think about that 10 years of information that they have, which 
maybe there's more. I don't know. This is chilling, but we need to think about it. Think about what would happen if the Vancouver police were like, maybe the RCMP would like to have this information too. And this is non-criminal information. These are records on innocent people. I don't even like the language of innocence and guilt, so I apologize. But to frame it the way that the state does, you've not convicted me of a thing. You have these records on me, and now you're sharing those records with the RCMP. But the RCMP, who operate in British Columbia, are a federal organization. So if BC's RCMP has it, doesn't that mean that the whole country's RCMP has it? What about the spy agency? What about the secret security agency, CSEC, that nobody even knows anything about? Do they have it? And then one time years ago, I really learned something because I went to the border. When I was like, I don't tell people this all the time, but when I was like 22, 23, I got uh, arrested. The charges against me were ultimately stayed. I don't have a record as a result of that. And yet, a couple years later, taking a trip to the United States, go to the border, pre-clearance at Pearson Airport. You don't have to go through when you get to the other side. They check your clearance. The border agents are already in your country and they do your pre-clearance before you get on the plane so that when you get off in the United States, you just go. And this border cop takes my passport. He looks at it, he runs it, and he's looking down and he's very casual. Where were you on July 24th, 2005? And I'm like, what? How do you know? Incidents involving the police that do not result in a criminal conviction being shared with officials, police officials, from a whole other country. This is what imperialism is really all like. This is how it's working. This is how these forces are like working together. This is how the Americans are collaborating. And it's like, we say they're so bad, so it's like, why are you giving them all the information? You know what I mean? Um, Those kinds of records, there's maybe two options I would offer. Because I think it's fair to have a disagreement on which one of these is better, but they're both worth considering. Either those records have to be completely destroyed because I don't trust y'all to keep them. And you could say you're gonna put them in a lock, but the safe is still in your house. Yo. Yeah. Or, if you're not going to destroy them, then take them away from the police and give them to the Privacy Commission, give them to somebody else, because you know something? In the sake of receipts, I do think that uh, 100 years from now, the world should be able to know that this was the way that black and indigenous people were still being treated on this territory. And if we destroy those records completely, we won't be able to prove that. Yeah. But. But the critical thing is that the police should no longer control those records. They have to be taken out of police control, whether they are destroyed or transferred to something else. Okay? So those are three very concrete things that would essentially, in my, um, I, in my opinion, in a practical way, abolish this practice that we call carding. And when people hear abolition, they always tell you it's too much, right? I talked about this at this, the, 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 the gala last night. They always want to compromise. They always want to tell you what power expects and then ask you to compromise with it. And I'm tired. I don't want to do that anymore because it's our lives that are at stake, right? So, these are ways that we can construct a coherent, understanding of what abolition means. Is that what you told the mayor? <laughs> that is exactly what I told the mayor. Uh, 
with Palette in 22 minutes. Because that was all the time that we had to talk. And yes, that's exactly what I told him. Whether he listens or not is going to be up to a lot of work and energy that needs to come yet. Um, but I did tell him that. And I said, if you want to follow up on those things, um, people are here to help you with that. And there are examples in other provinces, and there's legal expertise in other provinces. There's the BC Civil Liberties Association. There's the Union of British Columbia Indigenous Chiefs. People are doing this work already. Consult with them if you really want to move forward. That's what I told them. And I'm reporting that out to you because I didn't want to have to have a private conversation with the mayor about anything. I am not from here. It's not my right to come to your city and start dictating what I think should be happening. Private conversation to negotiate. Who am I to negotiate on behalf of anybody? It's not my right. So I share this all with all of you in the transparency that says, I did take that call, but I did it for the betterment of everybody here knowing that he was put on notice and you can hold him to account for the things that we talked about. Yeah. How are you guys feeling? Good. Yeah? I know we have this room until nine, nine right? Nine, nine o'clock. Um, so, um, we're all here together. Like Desiree said, it's, it's, it's nice when you talk and people are quiet and they're attentive and they listen. It makes me feel great. Um, but I didn't just want to come here and talk at you. And I want to open it back up again. And if there are things that people want to discuss, whether they have to do with carding or not, whether they have to do with other policy issues or not, whether it's just about like being black and wanting to go hug a tree. You're allowed to talk about that now too. Like that's what this space is supposed to be for. It's supposed to be for more healing. It's supposed to be for more sharing. I want to keep that spirit open. Um, and I want you to respond just as I've tried to respond to some of the things that you've said and that you've been talking about or feeling and thinking. But um, I've learned a lot about what life for black people can be like in Vancouver in the, for, in the few short days that I've been here. But I do want to hear more from people about what life is like, what you think about, what you struggle with, successes that you feel like you've had, even if they were just personal and nobody else knows about them. Um, I, I just, I want to engage. I want to engage. So um, again, anybody who feels like responding to anything that I've said, if you have a, a, a question or anything like that that you'd like to ask. Um, I don't want to do a formal Q&A. Yeah. Thank you, CCPA, for not doing a Q&A at last night's gala. <laughs> that was dope. <laughs> uh, a dear friend of mine has a really good philosophy for Q&As. Do an event when the speaker is finished, right before you have Q&A, you ask now, we're going to open it up to questions. Does anybody have a question? And you wait for anybody who has a question to put up their hand, and then you promptly escort all of those people out of the room, <laughs> and then you start the Q&A. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Did you get to experience the nature off on your days here? Yeah. The question is, did I get to experience any of that nature at all while I've been here? I did today. <laughs> you know something? Today, a friend took me to um, that beautiful garden in Chinatown. And even though it's November, and I've got to tell you, it's not like Toronto is like the tundra or something. But it's a lot, you know, less warm in the winter time than it is here. And I was quite awed and inspired to see in November, in mid-November, that one of the cherry blossom trees had fresh 
blossoms on it, and then there were bees buzzing around the cherry blossom in November. That was beautiful. And that was like one of the, like, it's like real. There's all these things that have been going on, like, since this bad thing happened to me that have been like reinforcing me and like helping me to be reaffirmed. And one of those things was actually just like trying to focus my camera lens so that I could get the details of the inside of the cherry blossom petal and the wasp that was trying to harvest something out of it. That was like really important. And, you know, I share those pictures online now because I can't describe it to somebody the way I just did to you, but when I'm sharing those images, like, that's what's happening for me. I am in that moment of awe. I'm just in wonderment of the world around me, and I'm happy. Those little tiny windows, I'm happy. I don't even remember when I'm flying out tomorrow, but before I do, I may be going to, you know, so if I'm like, if I'm gonna be like 100 with everybody in this room, when this night is over, I'm probably going to have a few drinks. So we'll see what happens in the morning. But uh, the, you know, sun's up at 7.30. Sun's up at 7.30. So rational minded Desmond is thinking he's gonna be up with the sun to finally go see those big five meter wide trees, I hope. Uh, so I don't want to just try to completely repeat what you just said, but when we reform and eliminate practices like carding, one of the things we do is to demonstrate, like, do you guys understand? The man who stopped me was driving a car alone burning gas, he had a gun on his hip. He's got all kinds of fancy, expensive equipment in the car. And he's using this to do what? Enforce a smoking bylaw that I wasn't even breaking? When we eliminate practices like this, it becomes apparent that we don't need these people driving around so much in the way that they're doing in the first place. Like, we don't need that kind of policing. It's redundant. It's wasting people's money to use the resources, as you just said, that could be used to actually support the communities that have been harmed by the police. So, again, it's, it's, it's about drawing those connections. Another thing I want to say is that um, a couple of the people that I hung out with this afternoon who took me to the garden in, in Chinatown are, uh, one is uh, Chinese, one is Taiwanese, and, um, I know that when we have these conversations, we have language. And we say black, and we say indigenous, and these are specific, and indigenous is not even that specific at all. And I'm trying to learn that in my language and in the ways that I speak. So, um, so for example, even as a breakdown of that, um, I had always understood that these territories were um, Coast Salish, territories, but then I've been given more specificity since I've been here still about the Musqueam Nation, um, two members of whom were at the gala, and um, please help me with the other, the Squamish Nation. This is beautiful that you even do this, like thank you. And so I'm getting that education out here myself, and I think it's important to name nations and to name communities, and there's a reporter I think our industry really needs to start learning how to do this. And I include myself in the criticism. Stanley Park is also called Kwai Kwai. Stanley Park is also called Kwai Kwai. Thank you. I did not know that either. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to count, I promise. Uh, what I wanted to say about that, though, is, is the two friends that I was talking about, is that um, maybe the terminology that they would feel encompasses part of their experience in these conversations is what we say POC, person of color. Uh, it is important for me to tell you all that 
white people are slightly, slightly overrepresented in carting stops also. This is one of the reasons why I'm an abolitionist. I don't think white people should be being stopped by the police for no reason either. I'm not out here putting that at the front of my conversation because, you know, dead ass, like, I'm trying to fight for myself and for my communities. We haven't forgotten about you, but, you know, you guys can do this too. Right? Sometimes people feel left down. And being the oppression the oppression Olympics is not the fun that you think that it is. It's not like it's, you know, nobody wants this. But you know, we say POC. So white people slightly overrepresented for their share of the population in carding data. And so how do you square that? Well, the answer is that another group has to be underrepresented. East Asian people are underrepresented in carding stops in Vancouver. That means the police are choosing to target East Asian people less often than other groups of people. I say that to say that it still happens, it's still wrong, and although this is a challenge for East Asian and for South Asian people in this part of the country, the role that I believe is very helpful for you to be able to play in that conversation is to ask why that is. Yes. You ask, why is it? You ask, because the white people will answer for you if you don't. And the white people will make a racist caricature of why you're not getting this smoke the way we are. Yeah. And you can't let them do that. Yeah. I don't believe in the term ally as a noun. If there is such thing as an ally, that means we're calling you that. You don't get to call yourself an ally, okay? If anyone's gonna call you that, it's gonna be the people who are, you, who are benefiting from your allyship. But, if there is such a thing as allies and allyship, that's what it can look like for me. Just as being a man who identifies as masculine and that's the way that the world sees me. I have to learn that allyship in that context means asking questions about why things are different and not trying to thrust myself forward all the time and offer my opinion all the time. We have to learn what it means to offer allyship. And I think for South Asian and East Asian people in this city, that's something I wanna give you to think about, is you are involved, you are implicated, you're also being stopped for no reason, and I acknowledge that. But you have a different role to play in the conversation, and we welcome that when it's done with care and concern and consent and respect. Um, I didn't think I was gonna go there, but I'm glad. And now, I'm so sorry, I'm good. Um, that looks amazing. Uh, but one of the things that Bell Hooks talks about is teaching in the academy, in universities, in often like very prestigious institutions for most of her career, and then leaving and feeling this sense of like, okay, so what do I do now? And she talks about teaching outside of the academy and having a commitment to learning and to education and teaching, not just in these elite, inaccessible spaces that most of us are never going to be in, but doing it in the community. And um, what you've just done, I think, is an example which says we have ways that we can educate ourselves and then go educate everybody around us. And one of the big work that we all have to do now with this new regime of so-called legalization of marijuana is we can't trust them. We have to educate ourselves and share that knowledge in community the way that you've just done here. Because, yes, if a 19-year-old has a blunt and hands it to an 18-year-old, 
That is trafficking to a minor, and you're correct, the punishment now is more severe than it was before. Another thing to note, you mentioned uh, driving. There's a notion now that it only just became illegal to drive while under the impairment of marijuana. <laughs> this is bogus. Impairment, by the way, is any kind of impairment while driving a vehicle. It means being tired. It means being on any drug that the police be, like, impairment is a judgment call. It's a discretionary call by a cop. And the problem, yo, can we talk about police discretion for a minute? Because what I fear in the new regime is the only thing people know about marijuana besides the smell is that it can make your eyes red. So what cops are gonna be doing is they're gonna be saying, I smelt it on him, I smelt it on her, or their eyes were red, and that's the pretext. Just like telling me I was smoking in a, in a park when I wasn't was the pretext, that's gonna be the pretext for us. And as you say, if the, if the marijuana was in your system from 10 days ago, how are they gonna know? By the way, uh, like, no test involving you drawing my blood on the side of the road is going to happen in this country, I'll tell you that right now. There are some things I'm really willing to fight people for. Some would say I'm willing to fight about everything, and I wouldn't necessarily disagree, but... Um, I don't think that's going to ever fly. We can't let those kinds of intrusions. There's already too many. But these are the things that we have to learn about so that we can share the education, so that we can share defenses with people who are most likely to be criminalized even under the new regime of, again, so-called legalization. Um, so thank you for sharing that and I hope that there are more forums in Vancouver and in British Columbia to say what's the new legislation, what's actually allowed now that wasn't before, what's not allowed. Um, Another thing that people don't realize is that basically what the government has said now is that even though marijuana is legal, there are two types of marijuana. You ever hear the word illicit? So that's an illicit substance, meaning you're not allowed to have it. So the, basically the government has said now there's licit marijuana and there is illicit marijuana. Meaning, just because you have it doesn't mean it's legal. Just because you have the prescribed amount or under the prescribed amount under law doesn't mean you're not going to get in trouble. If a cop really wants to be a jerk, maybe they see your tiny little container and then they start asking where you got it from and now you have another problem. So these are the kinds of education and the deep digging that we need to do to protect one another and to keep each other safe. You, you good? Okay. Um, so I was thinking, actually, because we're out at night, that um, one of the greatest parts about being in this space tonight is that we're here. And that, I don't know how often this happens here, but again, I'm assuming it's not that often. So I want to give time for us to do something that's really, really important before we leave, which is, um, I wanted to say this earlier, I. There are faces in this room that I haven't seen in years. Um, some of you leave the center of the universe that is Toronto, and I don't understand you, but... <laughs> See, you know I'm comfortable now, right? Yeah. Um, but I know a lot of people who, at one point or another, have been in the city and who have come out here. There's a lot of people in this room whose work I admire, who I've gotten to meet for the first time, or who I've been following on social media, and I got to meet you face-to-face -face for the first time today or yesterday, and that's been wonderful. And uh, I know how that enriches me, and I want us as a community to have that tonight for each other. So I want us to be able to spend some time this evening um, just saying hi, just getting more acquainted before we leave the space for nine. Um, so is there some, yeah, yeah, you want to do some stuff? Yeah, come on, you don't be scared. <laughs> um, but, yeah, you know what, take it, go ahead.
so there's a surprise in store for everybody that I just learned about. It was a surprise to me too. Um, before you do what I just said you should, we're going to have a little bit more Desiree Dawson, which is never a bad thing. And uh, yeah, so uh, after that, I encourage you to get up. You should probably get up during the performance yeah. and give her some love for all the incredible artistry that she's brought with us uh, to us this evening. And then I hope you get to spend the rest of the time saying hello and making the connections that are necessary, that are necessary, so that this healing, life-saving community work that we want to do together can thrive and continue, and that we can get more out of even just being here tonight. Um, Thank you, thank you, like, again, just for coming into this room at all, but for all of you who have ever been following my work from afar, who have ever shared anything that I wrote, who sent me a message, who came today and said some comforting things to me because you thought that that's what I needed to hear, and I did. Thank you. Thank you, Vancouver, for holding me in a way that I'm never, ever, ever going to forget. And I don't deserve this any more than anybody else in this room does. So let's remember that we have to treat each other like this every day. Yeah. The love. Sometimes I think about that, eh? The biggest gift I've been given since, um, you know, my career started going in a much more high profile direction a couple of years ago, the biggest gift that I've been given is that I'm in the street in Toronto, I'm in the market buying groceries, I'm on the subway, and a black person comes to me and they introduce themselves and they start storytelling. This is the biggest gift I have been given. And, you know, it's a blessing. And the love and the support and the, you know, Desmond, we see you're out here fighting for us and we appreciate that gives me the strength to continue. But we all need that. We all need to be seen. We all need to be acknowledged and loved. So let's leave this room tonight in that spirit of looking and seeing one another and acknowledging one another and making sure that this is not the last time that we see each other's faces. Thank you guys so, 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 so much.